there's just no getting around it, in chemistry we use numbers. And when we're doing problems or making measurements, there are some important numerical tools that we use. And that's our topic for today. Let's talk first about significant figures. Significant figures represent important pillars which support much of what we do with numbers in chemistry. When we report a measurement as a number, the number of digits we report communicates something to the reader about the precision. The proper number of digits reported is called the significant figures or sometimes significant digits. <laughs> To begin, let's clarify the difference between precision and accuracy. Keep in mind throughout this discussion that we're talking only about numbers that are measured, like weight or length. The precision of a measurement and the accuracy of a measurement mean two completely different things. It's the mark of a true chemist to know the difference. The precision of a measurement is the degree to which the measurement can be repeated to give the same result. The accuracy of a measurement is how close the measurement is to the true value. Now to illustrate these principles, let's look at a dartboard. If I throw three darts and they land on different points on the board, I'm neither precise nor accurate. I'm not precise because the darts aren't close to one another. And I'm not accurate because the darts are not in the center. And I have to admit this is the way I usually play darts. <laughs> If by practice, though, I'm able to hit the same spot with all three darts, I'm precise even though I may not be on target, that is, not accurate. If I practice really hard and all my darts land in the center, then I'm both precise and accurate. The darts are close together and right on target. Okay then, why significant figures? The number of significant figures, also called significant digits, remember, communicates to the reader how precise the measurement is. Keep in mind it tells us nothing of the accuracy of the measurement. Now let me remind you, what I'm about to say applies only to measured values, like how much you weigh, not exact numbers. Exact numbers would be the number of feet in a mile, for example. When we say that there are 5,280 feet in one mile, we don't assign significant figures to either 5,280 or to 1. You see, by definition, these numbers are infinitely precise. Now let's look at some measured numbers. Let's say I own an anvil factory, and I want to know how much a typical anvil weighs as it comes off my production line. To do this, we'll weigh some anvils on two different instruments. At the beginning, let's say I'm a cheapskate, and I decide at first to use my bathroom scale. I weigh three anvils on the scale. I get 149 pounds the first time, 146 pounds the second, and 148 the third. If I take the average of the three measurements on my calculator, I get 147.667 pounds. Now, how can we honestly report the weight of an anvil as measured this way? If I say a typical anvil weighs 147.667 pounds, then I'm implying that I'm using an instrument that can weigh to that precision. But look at the weights we measured. They're much further apart than that, so we really don't know the weight as precisely as the number on the right implies. In actual fact, all we know is that these anvils weigh between 146 and 149 pounds. We can express this limitation by the way we write our answer. Specifically, we say the average anvil weighs 148 pounds. Now when we write the number 148 pounds, the reader recognizes where the uncertainty of the measurement lies. He sees that we're certain of the first digit, the anvil weighs a hundred and some odd pounds. We're also quite sure of the second digit, which is four. The last digit is somewhat uncertain, however. Our instrument, the bathroom scale, only measures to the third digit, so we're only justified to report the third digit. 
By reporting the measured value this way, we're telling the reader that our measuring device is reliable to that precision. The reader recognizes that there is some ambiguity in the last digit reported. That last digit is where the imprecision of the measurement begins. It's still considered significant, but we understand that its significance is soft, and no digits after it are significant at all. Now let's take three more measurements on a fancy one million dollar super scale this time. Ah. Our first measurement on this scale is 148.02 pounds. The second is 148.04 pounds. And the third is 148.03 pounds. In this case, we are justified in reporting our average as 148.03 pounds. This is because the uncertainty of the number doesn't begin until the fifth digit, or the number 3. Therefore, this value has five significant digits, and the number is more precise than the one reported with the bathroom scale, meaning the measuring device is more precise. To summarize, the significant digits are all the certain ones plus the one which is slightly uncertain, in this case the 3. Now there's one more concept that's important for you to understand. That's the way we use the digit zero in expressing precision. Zero can be used in two ways, either to express an actual value or to simply indicate the power of 10 in the number. For example, in weighing the anvil, you notice that the weight shown contains a zero. That number is significant because it's in the middle. But the other way we use zero is at the trailing end of the number, such as in the value 360. When a scientist writes a number this way, he implies that only the three and the six are precise. The zero serves just as a placeholder, showing the correct power of 10 in the measured number. It isn't 36, it's 360. We say this number has only two significant digits. If we wanted the zero to have significance, we'd write the number a different way, as we'll illustrate in the subsequent slide. So, are you getting the picture? When we look at any measured value, the way it is written communicates the precision of the measurement by the number of significant digits that are shown. Let's look at the rules for counting significant figures or digits. First, always begin counting from the left. Second, start counting at the first non-zero digit. Third, if you see a decimal point, count to the last digit shown. Fourth, if you don't see a decimal point, count to the last non-zero digit. Now, as usual, these abstract rules don't mean much until we see them in action. Okay, let's look at some examples of applying the significant figure rules. How many significant figures are in this number? We begin counting from the left, and we start counting at the first non-zero digit. Since we don't see a decimal point, we count to the last non-zero digit. One, two, three, four, five, six. What about that last zero? Why don't we count it? Since there's no decimal point shown, the last zero is just a placeholder and has no real significance. This is true of any trailing zeros if there's no decimal point in the number. So, we say that 1,430,000 has six significant figures. Now let's try another. We'll start counting again at the first non-zero digit at the left. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, but what about this last zero? Why do we count it this time? Well, since we came upon a decimal point, we count all the zero digits at the end. Remember the rule? So. 100.320 has six significant figures also. 
Okay, here's a killer. Actually, it's not that bad. Take a second and try this one on your own. Well, let's find out how you did. Did you get four significant digits? Fantastic! Remember, you start at the first non-zero digit and include the last zero in the number since there is a decimal point. So we have one, two, three, four. Four significant digits. Sometimes ambiguities can arise with significant digits. Writing numbers in what is called scientific notation resolves these ambiguities. You may have used scientific notation before. In scientific notation we write a value as a number between 1 and 10 and then we multiply that number by 10 to some power. Let's look at some examples. Remember our previous example 100.320? As you recall this number has six significant figures. How would we convert this number to scientific notation? Well, we move the decimal over to the first significant digit and multiply the resulting number by 10 to some power. The power is the number of spaces that we move the decimal point. Let's see how this works. The first move gives us 10.0320 times 10 to the first. We move the decimal point a second time to place it right after the first digit. This gives us 1.00320 times 10 squared, and we're all done. Notice that the power of 10 is equal to the number of times we move the decimal point. You can see that when the number is written in scientific notation, we can clearly count the six significant digits. Remember I mentioned that writing numbers in scientific notation can avoid ambiguities? Let's look at our previous example, 1,430. When the number is written like this, until you look at it closely, you might be fooled into thinking that it has seven significant digits. That is, you might not notice that the last zero is not significant. Now convert this number to scientific notation. Notice that when this is done properly, the zero isn't needed as a placeholder anymore and doesn't appear at the end of the number. So in this form, the number of significant digits you see is the number of significant digits. Isn't that great? Aha! Uh -huh. And now for something completely different. How many significant figures does the number one million have? To help us find out, convert one million into scientific notation and count the number of digits. Take a moment and try it. Did you get one times ten to the sixth? Notice that we didn't keep the zeros when we moved the decimal place because they aren't significant. Counting the digits, we easily see that one million really has only one significant digit. The zeros in the original number are just placeholders. That's why it would be wrong to say that this number can be written as 1.000000 times 10 to the sixth, because that would imply that the number has seven significant digits. But wait now. What if we wanted to show a measured number that is really precise to seven significant digits with the exact value one million? Well, this is where scientific notation can really help. We now really can report the number as 1.000000 times 10 to the sixth, because then the reader knows the zeros aren't placeholders but are really significant because they're after the decimal point. This number represents a measurement value of exactly one million precise to seven digits. Ah, but now let's try one million and two. Take a minute to convert this to scientific notation to show how many significant figures this number has. If we put this number in scientific notation, we get 1.000002 times 10 to the sixth. In this form, we can clearly count seven significant figures. Remember, we must count all digits to the last non-zero. Since two is the last non-zero digit, we count all the zeros in between. Now let's look at how to handle significant digits when we do calculations. 
When we use a calculator, it gives us as many digits as its screen can show. It doesn't know anything about significant digits, but to be a good chemist, you need to show proper significant digits when reporting all measured values or values derived from measured values. In multiplication and division, our answers will have the same number of significant digits as the measured number that has the fewest significant digits used in the calculation. Huh? Uh, now, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> let's look at this example. And let's assume that all these numbers are measured values. If we do this on our calculator, the answer will appear 31.605. Now the question arises, how many significant digits should appear in the answer when it is expressed? It turns out that 31.605 has more significant digits than is correct. To figure out how many significant digits to show, we must look at each measured number used in the calculation. 3.5 has two significant digits, 2.10 has three, and 4.300 has four. 3.5 has the fewest significant digits, so our answer must have the same number as in 3.5, which is two significant digits. Now the question arises, how do we convert our answer into only two significant digits? To decide that question, we need to learn about rounding. Look at the digit next to the last significant digit. If that number is greater than or equal to 5, then round the significant digit up. If not, then leave the significant digit alone. As usual, these instructions don't make much sense till we see an example, so let's look at our previous answer. First, we need to look at the digit next to the last significant digit. Remember from our last slide that we want our answer to have two significant digits. So in our answer, the digit we have to round is the second digit. The digit that decides how we round is the third. The value of that digit is 6. So we ask ourselves, is that digit greater than or equal to 5? Well, greater than, obviously. So we round our last significant digit up. In this case, we round the 1 up to a 2. So the answer in the previous slide expressed to the correct number of significant figures is 32. Now, what would have happened if the number had been 31.405 when we did the calculation? Let's see. The number next to our significant digit is less than or equal to 5, right? So, in that case, we leave the significant digit as it is. Just to finish our story, you need to be aware that a different rule applies to assigning significant figures when we add or subtract. In this case, your answer will have the same number of decimal places as the last decimal place occupied by every term you add or subtract. For example, let's look at this problem here. Here's what your calculator will give you. The last decimal place that appears in all of these numbers is the second decimal place. So in our answer, we should have two decimal places. We round the 6 to a 7 because of the 5 to the right of it. And the answer is 33.47. Now the same rule applies to subtraction. And you'll learn these rules better as you practice. So have fun using the significant digit principles we've learned in this module in all of your chem problems in the future.